Hello, and welcome to today's webinar. We appreciate you joining us today for the top mistakes C-level executives make when overseeing security and compliance. We appreciate you joining this important topic and hope that it will be beneficial to you and your organization as we go through this today. Just a little bit about us here at Kirkpatrick Price. We are a licensed CPA firm and PCA, PCI QSA firm, and we provide assurance services to our clients worldwide. Uh, people hire us typically in order to perform assessments, audits, and we test controls in order to help our clients strengthen information security and compliance controls. Some of the things that we offer, people will hire us to do SOC audits, such as SOC 1 and SOC 2, SOC for cybersecurity. We do PCI audits, HIPAA, high trust. We offer audits in regard to the privacy frameworks that are out there, like GDPR and CCPA. And we also uh, perform independent reviews of your ISO 27001 information security management system. Our team also uh, provides penetration testing services to help uh, identify vulnerabilities within your environment. And we provide a number of consulting um, services in order to help you look at your policies and your risk assessment practices, business continuity, things like that, uh, in order to help you achieve your overall compliance goals. We want to invite you to connect with us in a variety of ways. We have a great blog that has a lot of regular updates about issues and tips and trends. Uh, webinars such as this one are recorded and available for you to download and, and watch them and share them with your teammates there within your organization. And we have a lot of free video resources as well that help explain uh, different concepts and issues when it comes to security and compliance. Just be sure to follow us on LinkedIn, Twitter, or Facebook in order to get the updates about this content that's out there. My name is Joseph Kirkpatrick, and I'm the president here at Kirkpatrick Price. Um, I've been in this field for over 20 years, and I started out in IT and eventually got into security. And I really enjoy helping people with data security issues, IT governance, and regulatory compliance. One of my favorite things to do is to walk people through uh, these issues that sometimes can be complex, help people understand it, and help them figure out how to apply it within their unique organization. And so today, what we're going to cover when we look at these top mistakes that executives make um, are really just four areas. The culture of security in your organization. Sometimes we, we make some critical mistakes in how we deal with security in our culture. Um, the language of cybersecurity and technology. We're going to look at some mistakes that we make because we have misperceptions about the differences between security and privacy. And then we're going to talk about the mistake of uh, not developing our team members the way that we should in order to support our organization. So starting off with the first one here, I see that one of the main mistakes that executives make when it comes to overseeing security and compliance is that we don't integrate these concepts into our culture. We have a tendency to marginalize it and treat it as just a function, just a department, just an individual's responsibility, and it's sitting over there in an office, in a corner. It's something that we dust off and look at in our board meeting once a year or maybe in a quarterly management meeting, we get a quick little update. And if we're managing security and compliance that way, we're missing the point and we're missing a huge opportunity in order to integrate this really, really important issue into our culture. And of course, the phrase that we've all heard a lot is culture is king. And the thing that makes your organization special, the thing that makes your organization um, unique, the thing that ties your employees to you, the thing that creates loyalty um, with the people who work for you and with you and the thing that really you know binds everybody together is culture and if you've got a great culture within your organization that focuses on um, you know teamwork sometimes I'll, I'll see that within organizations they focus on having a culture that uh, identifies teamwork 
as a value. Well, that is a thing that you'll hire for. That is a thing that you'll train towards. That's a thing that you will communicate regularly uh, throughout your organization. It'll, it'll be just part of the everyday life. And people will understand that we're about teamwork. Um, here in our organization, because we are an audit firm, uh, one of our top culture uh, items that we talk about is, is integrity. You know, we have to have integrity in what we do. We have to be truthful. Um, we have to always, you know, do the right thing when it comes to looking at people's compliance with laws and regulations and whether or not controls are working. As you can imagine, we get asked quite frequently by clients to not report on certain findings that we have. And we can't do that because that would be a loss of integrity on our part if we you know, were to ignore something important or ignore um, a compliance finding that we had in our audit. We talk about quality. You see that as something that's internal to an organization's culture. You know, we are about quality. And so we talk about that every day. I, I hear it discussed every day. I, I hear it in our meetings. I see it in our policies. I see it in our trainings. And quality is, is a big deal. And so we train to that. One time I was visiting a client and they were doing something with retirement planning services. And I thought, well, this will be a real you know, stuffy organization. This is kind of a boring, you know, type of thing uh, from my perspective. But the first thing I saw when I went in to their lobby was that they said that they focused on fun and they had a culture of fun. And as I got to discuss things with them and, and talk to them, um, I realized that it was something that was baked into the attitudes of the people there. It was this attitude of, we're going to have fun with what we do. We're going we're gonna to have fun with our clients. We're going to have fun with each other. And so they had built that into their culture. And you can do the same thing with security. And I'm afraid that executives don't integrate that. You know, they, they think so much about the rest of the uh, values that the organization is going to espouse and is going to model. But the mistake that they make is they forget to make security part of the culture if that's something that is important to you and it should be because of the threat that we experience. I want to go through a few things about this. Um, when you're thinking about putting something like a cybersecurity culture into your organization, you know, if it's something that you want everybody to know about and be responsible for, then you need to have some type of a management plan for putting security into your culture. Everybody needs to know what your security objectives are. Um, I believe we've done a good job here of putting that into our culture because everybody knows that our objective is we don't want any of our clients to ever be hacked. We don't want to be hacked. And, you know, it might happen someday. But our objective is to not let that happen. And so no matter how little the concern is, how, how little uh, maybe a, a feeling is that you have about it, everybody knows that they need to bring it up because that's an objective of ours. And everybody understands that objective. We, you have to have training, uh, education in order to teach people what this is, in order to build it into the um, culture of the organization. And so uh, talking about it, training to it is very important because um, on a regular basis, my employees get emails purporting to be from me. They get text messages purporting to be from me. And they're being asked to, um, you know, buy gift cards and wire money and do all of these things. And because they know that we're trying to avoid those kinds of things, because we have educated our people about that, about that, there's this culture of we need to confirm these requests before we do it. And it has stopped um, a lot of attacks, a lot of fraud, and it's built into our, our culture because we've trained around that. And then finally, um, something that you should put into your management plan here is 
making it an employee's personal responsibility to be responsible for security. I go into a lot of organizations and I hear them talk like, oh, that's that's Janie's responsibility. Janie handles security here in our company. And you have to change the way you talk about that because we all handle that. We're all in information security. We're all in compliance. And just one employee making a mistake somewhere or one employee not feeling the freedom to report a concern can lead to a compliance fine, um, you know, a hacker getting into our system, um, leaking information out when it shouldn't, a misconfiguration on uh, some of our technology, you know, that can lead to very damaging results. And so making sure that everybody understands that part of our culture is that we're responsible for security in our role is uh, really, really critical. When we talk about training, I think that we as executives have to understand the changing landscape of our workforce. Every day, millennials are becoming a bigger and bigger portion of our workforce. And we have to adjust the way that we train and the way that we teach around those changing uh, demographics that we have going on. And according to the Federal Trade Commission, 18% of adults over 70 are victims of fraud. And we all have this attitude and we actually believe this myth that senior citizens are the ones who fall for fraud. Oh, grandma, she just, you know, fell for this this ploy, this person called or this piece of mail came and, and they're so susceptible to uh, fraud. And we, we focus a lot on that segment of the population when it comes to protecting them from the attacks that are out there. But actually the truth is, according to the FTC, that 40% of adults age 20 to 29 are victims of fraud. A way larger group. And why is that? Well, that group uses technology more. So they're going to be exposed to a lot more uh, fraud, fraudulent activities. Uh, that group of people is more open about sharing. They are more willing to connect to a stranger and share information with a stranger. It's part of their mindset. Uh, the reason people over 70 actually are lower in the percentage of being a victim is because that's the paranoid group of our culture. And so they've already got this baked in paranoia into the things that are happening out there. So as executives, we need to recognize this and understand that, oh, we have to adjust our training and our education for this segment of our workforce because they are facing different issues than um, some of our older employees are. And so you have to ask yourself as you're building this culture within your organization and you're trying to bake security into it, am I providing the necessary training and the, and the right training to this newest segment of the workforce? Because it might be an area that we're not um, really honing in on enough. And this is something that really concerns me, and I've, I've seen this in some of our audits that we perform, and that is there's actually a growing apathy in our culture towards this. And as executives, we have to take responsibility for helping to turn the tide about the attitudes and value systems within our organizations. There was a study here by Accenture, and they surveyed 912 qualified employees of health providers and payer organizations in the U.S. and Canada. And so think about these environments. These are organizations that have protected healthcare information. They are responsible for keeping this information private. And they're, they're responsible for the security around that information in order to keep it private. And so you would think within organizations like that, there, was, there would be this culture of protecting it and being sensitive about it and all those things. But according to this survey, 18% responded 
that they would be willing to sell confidential data to unauthorized parties for as little as $500 to $1,000. And that figure is shocking to me. You know, I can't believe that one in five would say, I would be willing to sell this for 500 to 1,000 bucks. And so what does that say about our culture? What does that say about our value system? It's something that's changing. And if executives are not facing this head on and saying, okay, I'm responsible for our culture, I'm the leader of it, and I need to drive the training and education that needs to happen with our organization, We've got to address this, and we've got to be aware that this type of attitude is developing within our workforce. One of the engagements that we did one time, you know, sometimes people hire us and they don't tell us why they're hiring us. And then after you're, you're working with a client and you're getting to know them, then they let their guard down. They let you know. But I'll never forget one time we got hired to perform a security assessment for a company. And finally, I was talking to the CEO um, as we were engaged in the uh, the project and I said so what you know drove you to hire us to do this for you because it was their first assessment that they'd ever had and he said well one day um, a police officer walked into our lobby and informed us that one of our employees had just been arrested in the parking lot for selling one of our client files to an undercover detective and he sold it for $500. And after that happened, we just thought, wow, we've got to do something to change this. You know, so we moved all of our data into a locked room and, and uh, we only let certain people in there now. And so, you know, now we want to have an assessment to see if somebody can access this data. And that was a good assessment for determining if an outsider could get to it. But how are you going to deal with this when an insider decides that, yeah, I'll take this and I'll sell it for 500 bucks? Um, we can't ignore this as executives and we've got to um, um, figure out how to change that type of culture and address it within our organizations. 24% of the health employees said that they actually knew of someone within the organization who has sold their credentials or access to an unauthorized outsider so it's very scary and it is reflecting um the changing values that we have out there and our cultures have to counteract that and our leadership models have to think about this um, so that we're not making the mistake of ignoring it and not trying to um, make some changes in these areas there was an article last year in CSO magazine, and I thought it was really relevant for this conversation today. And the article is titled, Five Signs Your Security Culture is Toxic. And I think this reflects some of the mistakes that we make as executives in dealing with culture in our organizations. And according to the survey last year of 408 CISOs, they said that the average tenure of a CISO is less than three years. And I see this a lot. I see so much turnover. And this is all just my opinion here. But I believe that there's so much responsibility placed on a CISO. And it's a job where you're destined to fail because there are going to be breaches, there are going to be incidents. And because leadership above the CISO is not engaged in that and they don't understand it and they haven't integrated it into their culture and they leave this person dangling in the wind over here being the sole individual responsible for security within the organization, they get frustrated and impatient and so they they terminate that person, they replace them. Um, some really good people that are in these roles um, get blamed for the things that happen within our organization when actually they're very talented, they're very capable of dealing with these problems, but management, because they stay at arm's length, they don't 
They don't help them. They don't support them. They don't communicate with them. And actually two thirds of the respondents said that, or I'm sorry, a third, almost a third said it's less than two years is the tenure. So there's a lot of turnover out there. And there's a quote in the article that said, you end up with an organization in a constant state of flux. And that's not good for our culture. It's not good for our security culture when the organization knows that that position is just a revolving door of people who fail and get blamed. And those are the five signs that your security culture is toxic. Do you play the blame game? You know, when, when an incident happens, when there's a vulnerability, um, as an executive, do you, do you blame the, the CISO? Or do you support them? Do you empower them to deal with those issues and conquer those issues um, and make it part of your overall organizational um, structure instead of just making it a separate division of there? Is there cynicism? within your organization. Um, this is a sign that your culture is toxic. One of the very common things that surprises our clients is we will have audited someone for five years, let's say, and the company just thinks, oh, we've got this, this is all normal, this is routine, this is just kind of the you know, expected results of the audit every year. And then one year, it's just, it falls apart. It's a disaster. There's findings everywhere. There are critical problems. Um, you know, they go from an unqualified opinion to something where we're qualifying the opinion because their vulnerability management program isn't working right, or their um, their um, you know risk management program isn't isn't functioning properly. And why did it fall apart? Well, they got acquired by a new company. And there's been a culture shift. There's been a change. And the employees have developed this attitude of cynicism. You know, that, oh, I've, I see this every year multiple times. You know, the company goes, yeah, well, we used to do that stuff, but we got bought. And, you know, we're, we're merged with this organization over here now. And now they're responsible for it. And they're doing a horrible job. And I don't trust them. And, you know, they, they don't do it like we used to, blah, blah, blah. And so those things develop within our cultures and it reflects a toxic one. Internal vulnerabilities are a sign that it's toxic. Again, it goes back to the attitude of employees not reporting things, not doing things the right way, not following protocols. And we ignore or cause internal vulnerabilities to happen. When the culture is no, 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 no. When security is always, well, that's the no department. Rather than, let's look at this and let's figure out the best way to handle this and, and work with this. Um, that's something that, as leaders, we need to look at. What is, what is the tone and what are we communicating uh, within our organizations about this? And then finally, as we've we've said already, security is siloed. You know, you keep it you keep it over there in the corner. And so those are five things that I think you can look at to see, are you making any of these mistakes? Because this is something that you can start changing today within your organization with a fresh approach. And so what are some of the things that, that these successful organizations do to integrate security into culture? Here's, here's a, a result from a work, Workforce 100 um, survey that I think give us some good um, tips, we can put our security and compliance mission and values in our onboarding. You know, it needs to be part of bringing people into our organization. It needs to be included in our company communications. Whenever we're sending out our memos and our newsletters and our emails and our posters on the wall and our um, our monthly reviews, our weekly check-ins with our staff, we need to be talking about it and make sure that it's part of our normal communication. We need to have um, training and learning uh, to be covering these topics as we're training our workforce. It needs to be built into our work processes. It doesn't need to be a separate thing that's hard for people to go do separately. It needs to be part of the everyday 
actions so that people understand how security and compliance apply to their job and what they do on a daily basis. We need to hire for the cultural fit. We've got to determine, is this, is this someone who is excited about our value system here? Are they, are they excited about working here? Can they get behind our mission and our values that we have? And then is it part of the employee review process? Those are some things to definitely consider. And then senior le leaders need to look at themselves and, and ask the question, have I established a clear vision for what we're doing in security? Have I set a strategy? Have I worked with that, that security team, with that uh, compliance team in order to put a strategy together? Do I, as a leader, model mission and values, or am I ignoring it? Am I just treating it like it's not my responsibility, or, or am I front and center in modeling that for the company? Do I set that tone? Do I solicit feedback? Do I care about this? Do I ask about it? Do I... Do I hear what's going on? These are all things that that senior leaders need to take responsibility for. Okay, so that was a big one. That was the one that I wanted to spend the most time on because I think that it's the biggest mistake. And so many things will fall into place for your organization if we address that very, very important area of building security and compliance into our culture. But if uh, the, the last three that I want to talk about for our remaining time, and this one is avoiding conversations about security and compliance. I see a mistake that leaders make when it comes to engaging in these conversations. And usually it's because they're uncomfortable with the conversations. They don't feel knowledgeable. They don't feel equipped. And nobody likes to feel stupid. And so... As a leader, well, I'm supposed to be together. I'm supposed to be, you know, all knowing. And so I just won't engage in the conversation that might expose my ignorance about that. And so we avoid it. And that's how we start, you know, blaming the other people. And that's how we start putting all the responsibility on the other people because we avoid those um, conversations. But if security and compliance is important to you and your organization, then as a leader, you have to recognize that this company can only grow as far as I grow. And if I have put a lid on it, if I have put a cap on how far I'm willing to go on engaging in this very, very important topic, then the rest of the organization is not going to perform very well. So going back to what we said about modeling it, you know, the, the, the leader has got to engage in it and show their support uh, for these concepts. And I think one thing to think about is just the language that we use. We, you know, we are intimidated by the acronyms. We're intimidated by the knowledge of our technical people. And I gave that up a long time ago. You know, I don't have to know everything that my best people know because they're more skilled than I, than I am in these areas. They are more equipped. They have more experience, more training. And so I'm not trying to compete with them. I'm not trying to know everything that they know, but I do want to be able to have a conversation with them. I do want to be able to communicate I want them to know that I support them and I want them to know that I want them to bring things to me and feel free to talk to me. I don't want the cynicism to develop of, well, don't talk to Joseph about this. He doesn't understand anything that's going on. And, you know, you know, it's a waste of time talking to him. I don't want that. And so I do want to be able to have a common language with them. And so just to use an example, of AWS, you know, so many of our clients have within the last three years migrated to that platform. And so you've got a lot of different terms that are new to that area. And so these are things that I had to dive into and I had to learn. I had to do some training just to learn the terminology so that I would know 
what my people were talking about. You know, what's a certificate manager? What does CloudFront do? What does CloudTrail do? Um, when they say EC2, what is that? Oh, that's Elastic uh, Compute Cloud. What, what's Elastic Beanstalk? Uh, when they say IAM, that's Identity and Access Management. What's Lambda? What's a relational database service? What are security groups? And, you know, I keep hearing about these S3 buckets that leak sensitive data out. You know, what, what's an S3 bucket? Oh, it's simple storage service. And so maybe, maybe it's uh, too simple to enable that to be public sometimes. And so um, we need to check and make sure that we have uh, made those things private and that we're protecting that data. But this language is something that as a leader, you don't have to know all about it. But if your people are talking about it, if your people are working with this every day, and it's what your platform is, you want to learn some of the terms so that you can engage in those conversations and not uh, avoid it completely. And I've seen, I've seen people who have zero training, zero background in this area, but they're willing to, to look at the AWS glossary and figure this out. We've got a lot of resources, a lot of videos and things like that that explain what these things are. We'll help you learn what this is. We're all about education here at Kirkpatrick Price. And so if you want to learn about this, we'll help you do that. But whatever it is that's important to your people, you know, you're leading people and you have to develop that common language with them. Another thing that I like to show people, and especially executives who maybe are a little intimidated by having these these technical conversations or these um, these security conversations. I, I like to show them the NIST cybersecurity framework, which is what this table is from. And when I'm training security people and technical people about how to communicate better with senior management, I talk to them about how senior management is going to understand more about risk. You've got to learn how to talk about risk and risk management because those concepts are easily applied uh, when you're talking to someone in, in an executive position. But it's a two-way street. And so when we're having our conversations about our internal struggles and challenges, um, if we just talk past each other, that's a big mistake that we're making. And so we have to develop a common language. And I think this is a very simple way to think about it because now we can lump our conversations into one of five areas. Are we talking right now about identifying our risk and our threats and the systems that we're trying to protect? Are we talking about protecting them right now? Are we talking about detecting issues? Are we talking about responding to issues? Or are we talking about recovering from um, an incident that happened because really all of these conversations that we need to have with our security folk and our compliance folk are in one of these five areas. And so as an executive, I can grasp these five areas and categorize them in my mind for conversations with my staff. You know, are we talking about protecting right now or are we talking about recovering from something that's already happened? <laughs> and this table um, provides some of these um, subcategories of things that fall under each one. You know, when we're protecting our systems, um, we protect them via access controls. We protect them via awareness and training, data security, information protection processes, maintenance, and protective technology. And so it kind of helps us understand some of the language that's out there and some of the terms so that we can engage in these conversations. So I always, I always recommend this framework for people who um, are leading security and technology departments. Let's talk about mistake number three. Our third mistake is when we treat security and privacy as the same thing. I see executives do this all the time. They assign the responsibility for security and privacy to the same person. They put it all on one person. They talk about it as if, as if it's the same thing. They, um, they don't realize the nuances between the two. 
And one of the things that I like to say is that security enables privacy. They are two, th they are two concepts. Privacy is the thing that we're after. We're trying to keep something private. We're trying to keep our information private. We're trying to keep our clients' information private. We're trying to keep our internal processes private. We're trying to keep our trademarks and our patents private. Um, you know, that's what we're after. But how do you do that? Well, you do it through security. You do it, that's one of the ways that you do it. You, you, put, um, you put controls into place in order to enable privacy. And these things are not all one department's responsibility. These things are everybody's responsibility. And so we have to think about how do these things get handled and who's responsible. And it's a mistake to think that it's the same thing or that one person can deal with it. And so security is about controlling risk. The risk exists. It's never going to go away. I had a client one time who hired us to facilitate a risk assessment with them. We went through all their risks, all the things that they were facing, fires, floods, employee theft, hackers, uh, loss of business, you know, and we completed the thing and the CEO, we sent the report that outlined all the risk and the CEO contacted me and literally said, okay, how can I get a report that shows that we have no risk? They said, I don't, I can't show this to a client because I don't want to tell them that we have risk. Well, everybody has risk. It's, it's the truth. It's the, the way it is. And security is about controlling those risks. But the important thing is that you have selected controls to put into place in order to control the, that risk. And the security controls that are out there are physical in nature. And so that might be one type of person in your organization who is responsible for the locks and the cameras and you know building security. And uh, then you've got administrative controls, which might be another person who's good at policy and who's good at training. And then you've got technical controls. So that's maybe a different type of person in your organization. You know, security is not just about technology security um, goes across all these different departments and so there are going to be different people involved in that and we can't we can't think that it's just one area but then when it comes to privacy now you're talking about a lot of things that are legal in nature um, what information are we collecting from people what consent are people giving us to collect their information and to use their information? Do we have the right policies published on our website? Are we communicating the right policies to our workforce? We're not going to put issues like that on your IT administrator. You need to engage legal counsel and people who understand compliance issues and are educated and trained in that. And so as a leader, We've got to see that and we've got to assign the right responsibilities to the right places because the people that you put into place to monitor our privacy practices and our use and retention of data that we get, that's, that's going to be a completely different person from the person who's responsible for monitoring our security controls. And so they're very different. And sometimes I see executives not understanding that and making a mistake of lumping it all together as one uh, issue. All right, and then finally, our last mistake that I want to cover today is not investing in the team. And I see people being penny wise and pound foolish on this. Um, I'm going to say this is an informal um, survey that I'm doing in my own brain here because I, I visit a lot of clients. I talk to a lot of people, a lot of different environments. I look at a lot of audits every year. And I will say that 90% are not training their staff and not developing their staff in a way that maximizes and capitalizes on the talent that you already have 
within your team. And so what does that do? That creates that cynicism within our organization if we're not investing in our people. You've got this person, you've hired them, they're skilled, they're talented. It's going to be way more expensive to replace that person. It's going to be way more expensive to um, you know, bring somebody in to fix an issue because we didn't take the time and we didn't spend the money to develop the staff that are sitting right in front of us. You've got some very talented people on your team. You've got skill. You've got this raw talent that can be developed into something more. And so identifying that and training them, developing them is something that as an executive you should be doing. It's a mistake to ignore that and let that become stagnant to where people um, don't feel like they're being developed into that. And so when I say 90% are not, I go into these environments where they're developing solutions that they're delivering to their clients, but they don't send the developers to any kind of security training. They're not um, you know, giving them the latest and greatest. They're not giving them the access to cutting edge technology, the education that these people can go and get and come back and say, hey, here's some changes that we need to make. Here's some new technologies that we should be using. And so we do that a lot of times because we're afraid of spending the money. We're afraid of developing them and letting them leave. But we're missing a huge opportunity to improve our organizations because we're not investing in that. And so we need to look at our secure coding practices. You know, are we, are we training our workforce? I, I see that our organizations are doing a woeful job on um, training our people on secure coding practices. Uh, DevOps, you know, if, if delivering an application or delivering an application to your back office operations that, that you rely on um, is important, then you should be giving your staff training on improving those processes and becoming more uh, adept at DevOps. Um, what platform are you on? Is it AWS, is it Azure, is it Google Cloud? Do you give them access to that training? Do you send them to, to events? Do you give them the time to attend the virtual events that these organizations put together? They put together great content and great training and they're they're teaching um, a lot of wonderful practices but we've got to um, allow our team in order to uh, participate in that um, are we giving them vendor training so many times we go in and because we do so much training and we do so much education with our staff you know we find that as the auditor we're going in and teaching them about Linux capabilities and and Microsoft tools and VMware issues and misconfigurations um, you should be giving them access to that so that they can develop and learn and grow in those areas um, I'm surprised by the things that people don't know about changing laws and, and compliance issues and so are we training our staff are we teaching them about these things that are happening out there are we giving our people leadership training we need to develop leaders within these um, functions in our organization and so are we developing the staff to lead security and compliance very very important and it's a mistake if we're not and then blue team exercises you know a red team is the team who is attacking your system in order to test it the blue team is your team that defends it and so I know a lot of executives they expect their people to defend against the attackers. Oh, you're responsible for monitoring. We have a SOC over here that's, that's monitoring our security operations and they're supposed to respond to all these attacks that are happening every hour. Um, but are we giving them blue team training in order to sharpen their skills and, and match up against what the attackers are doing? Definitely something for us as executives to look at. So I hope that this has given you some things to think about. We've, we focused on 
the negative here, you know, things we're not doing. But the good news about any of this is that as a leader, we can decide today to change our approach. And these things can start changing today and start doing some of the things that will contribute to our more effective um, understanding of security and compliance within our organization. We'd love it if you would submit questions to us today uh, about any of this. We're happy to help on any of these topics that uh, you might have questions about. I also want to pitch to you um, on this on this concept of training and, and developing people. I'm uh, on a committee for the Cybersecurity for Executives Certificate Program with the University of South Florida, and they have uh, this certificate program. It's a four-day program that you might look into. They have um, in-person classes, and they have online classes, and it's for the leader, it's for the executive who needs to understand more about cybersecurity. And if this is something that you'd be interested in, you can contact me. I have access to uh, discount codes and things like that um, that can help you get engaged with the program. We'd be happy to uh, point you in the right direction on that. Also, we want to ask you to participate in a three-question survey at the end of this webinar today. Uh, answering those three questions will help us understand your needs and develop uh, good topics for you in the future. We appreciate you joining and look forward to receiving your questions. Thank you very much.